Hello, and welcome to the AWS Machine Learning Summit. Today, you will learn about the compelling work happening within our scientific community in Amazon, including Amazon scholars and distinguished engineers. You will hear directly from our customers, including 3M, Bundesliga, Vanguard, and many more about how they are addressing business challenges and opening up new opportunities with machine learning. And you will also learn about how our services can be applied to your own use cases. Machine learning is one of the most transformative technologies we will encounter in our generation. ML is improving customer experience, creating more efficiencies in operations, and spurring new innovations and discoveries like helping researchers discover new vaccines and enhancing agriculture output with better crop monitoring. But we are just scratching the surface about what is possible. And there is so much invention yet to be done. Accelerating adoption of ML requires bright minds to come together and share learnings, advances, and best practices. This is why I am so excited to bring all of you together today for a day dedicated to machine learning. In fact, the scientific work in machine learning is exploding Scientific paper publication has grown exponentially over the past years, and today it has been estimated that more than 100 papers are published a day. Advancements in machine learning fueled by scientific research, abundance of compute resources, and access to data has also meant that machine learning is going mainstream. We see this in our customers' adoption of the machine learning technology. More than 100,000 customers use AWS for machine learning. And machine learning is enabling companies to reinvent entire tranches of their business. For example, Roche, the second largest pharmaceutical company in the world, uses Amazon SageMaker to accelerate the delivery of treatments and tailor medical experiences. Discovery Plus streaming service is using Amazon Personalize to help its customers cure choice paralysis by offering tailored content suggestions. The New York Times uses contact lenses newly introduced real-time analysis features to respond to customer issues in the moment. The BMW Group is using Amazon SageMaker to process, analyze, and enrich petabytes of data in order to forecast the demand of both model makes and individual equipment on a worldwide scale. We can see right before our eyes that machine learning science is translating to real customer adoption. And that's not by accident. At Amazon, everything we do starts with customer, and we work backwards from there. We are well known for our customer obsession, and that is also the case with how we approach scientific innovation. We call it customer-obsessed science. So, what does customer obsessed science mean? This means a few things. First, rather than doing science for science sake, we work backwards from the customer problem and invent to meet those needs. While our researchers do publish papers and contribute to the overall industry, their focus is on bringing new experiences and products to our customers. At AWS, 90% of what we do and what we build is driven by what customers tell us matters. And the other 10% are things we hear from customers where they may not exactly articulate what they want, but we try to read between the lines and invent on their behalf. Second, our teams of researchers are usually embedded in the business. So science goes directly to the customer. Researchers that come to AWS and Amazon want to help create powerful innovations that impact millions of people and make machine learning accessible to every organization. For instance, Yol Marek, VP of Science for Alexa Shopping, who you will hear later from in this talk, sits within the Alexa Shopping team so that the incredible innovations that our team invents can be applied directly towards enhancing the Alexa user experience. Third, once we have invented these amazing technologies, we get the results of that work into the hands of our customers at scale. 
and then we learn and iterate from their feedback and start the process of working back from the customer needs all over again. Now, let's look at a few examples where we have worked backwards from the customer to develop science and then brought it directly to our services at AWS. First, let's take a look at one of the prerequisites to all machine learning, training data and the need to learn with less of it. Humans are incredibly good at learning from a few data samples, but machine learning still requires a lot of data. For instance, a few years ago, when my daughter was two, she could easily learn the difference between an apple and an orange with just a few examples. On the other end, a machine learning model might have needed hundreds of label pieces of data to reliably identify between an apple and an orange. Moreover, the process of data labeling is time consuming and labor intensive process altogether. And as machine learning has become more mainstream and more and more companies want to use it, accessing vast stores of data and annotating that data is too tedious and expensive to scale. For instance, the NFL wanted to use computer vision to more easily and quickly search through thousands of media assets. But the manpower to tag all these assets at scale was time and cost prohibitive. Or take the example of Duff Guts, a family business that has been making frozen foods for consumers in Sweden and around the world for 80 years. They have to ensure that every pizza coming off of their line has the perfect amount of cheese in order to meet the needs of their discerning customers. Dafkats wanted to use a more intelligent method for quality control of its pizza, making in order to increase quality and efficiency. Their IT team of 12 had limited expertise in machine learning. So they partnered with us to build an automated machine learning system to do visual quality inspection. Now, to solve this problem for our customers, our team of scientists are investing in a technique called few-shot learning, and they wanted to bring few-shot learning to our services. Few-shot learning tries to replicate the human ability to learn a specific task from just a few examples by incorporating previous knowledge. For instance, if you know how to add, you will learn how to multiply faster. It's a different operation, but the same underlying framework. Now, we have taken this cutting edge technique, made optimizations, and incorporated it to our services so that our customers can create models custom to their own use cases with very little data. We use few-shot learning today in the custom labels feature of Amazon Recognition, our service for image and video analysis, which allows users to identify objects and scenes in images that are specific to their needs with as few as 10 images per label. The NFL uses custom labels feature to apply detailed tags for players, teams, objects, action, jerseys, location, and more to their entire photo collection in a fraction of time it took them previously. In industrial, we use it in Amazon Lookout for Vision, our service for automated quality inspection so that customers like DAFGARDS can start to identify quality defects in industrial processes with as few as 30 images to train the model, 10 images of defects or anomalies plus 20 normal images. But in fact, while building Lookout for Vision, we actually had an interesting scientific challenge because modern manufacturing systems are so finely tuned, defect rates are often 1% or less and they are typically very slight defects. As a result, the data we needed to train the algorithms that power Lookout for Vision should as much as possible reflect the reality of having small percentage of defects, but, an, but there are not just obvious defects, but slight or nuanced defects. So the scientists and engineers working on this project realized early on that the sample defects that they were training models on didn't match the shop floor reality. So we did something really creative. We actually built a mock factory. The team procured conveyor belts and cameras and objects of various types to simulate 
various manufacturing environments. The goal was to create data sets that included normal images and objects, and then draw or create synthetic anomalies, such as missing components, scratches, discoloration, and other effects. Few shot learning allowed the team to occasionally work with no images or defects at all. That real life trial and error iterative process eventually led to the development of Lookout for Vision, which today is being used by customers like Daft Gods to inspect and verify product quality. Let's move to another example, which also happens to be in computer vision, but related to text extraction. Many of our customers use machine learning to extract meaning from documents or images in order to save time and costs associated with manual processing of these documents. While traditional text extraction technology is really good at understanding regular text when it is clearly laid out, well-written, and horizontal. However, it's not as good at understanding irregular text, which is blurred or where the characters aren't aligned in a horizontal manner. These results from recent state-of-the-art methods on public academic data sets show only a 70 to 80% accuracy. Of course, we live in the real world, where customers have faded receipts, blurry images, and doctors' handwritten notes to analyze. So we knew we needed to solve this problem for our customers. When addressing irregular text, models today can implicitly learn language by encoding contextual information in order to infer what the word is, even when only a few letters are properly visible. For instance, if a three-letter word begins with TH, the model will likely predict that the word is the. However, this capability can also lead to errors when models misinterpret contextual information or when the model struggles to understand text that isn't an actual word, like a handwritten social security number. Because in those cases, contextual information will simply be redundant. So ML models must be able to learn when to use visual information and when to use contextual information. And this hasn't been done well to date. To address this, our team invented a new method called Selective Context Attentional Scene Text Recognizer, or SCADR. Here is how SCADR works. Let's take this word from a doctor's note. With SCADR, the image passes through an architecture that is composed of a series of stack blocks, which model the contextual information. In each block, the contextual information, we also have a novel decoder, which helps the model learn whether to use contextual information or visual information, depending on the image itself. As it passes through each block, the model improves the encoding of contextual dependencies and thus increasingly refine the predictions. And the final prediction is taken from the final block. In this case, the word is iotic. This method surpasses the state-of-the-art performance on irregular text recognition benchmarks by 3.7% on an average. 3.7% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you think about it, that's millions of words each day that get the right prediction for our customers. Scatter is available today in Amazon TextTrack, a service that automatically extracts text handwriting and data from scanned documents and also in Amazon recognition. Few shot learning and scatter are just a few examples of how we apply customer access science to our products at AWS. This is how science works across Amazon. Yol Marek, Vice President of Research and Science at Alexa Shopping, works with a team of scientists to constantly create state-of-the-art <coughs> machine learning in order to make the experience of interacting with Alexa even better. One example of making Alexa more personable is can we give Alexa a sense of humor? To share more about how our team is giving Alexa a sense of humor using machine learning, I'd like to introduce Yol Marek. 
Hello everyone, and uh, thanks Swami for inviting me here to uh, talk about uh, uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, computational humor. I'm delighted to host everyone here virtually with, as you can see, a quite a nice view on the beach. So let's talk a little bit about uh, computational humor. You might say um, that you know computational humor is not really uh, a serious topic for a serious scientist to, to research. But actually, uh, you know, even if it doesn't look that important in our very task-oriented uh, world, uh, we are actually considering and we are addressing a very hard AI challenge. If you think about it, it goes back to the early days of, uh, of AI, when uh, Alan Turing really showed us the way with his uh, seminal paper on uh, computing machinery and intelligence in the 50s. And in that paper, uh, Turing being a true visionary, um, actually, um, Turing started to argue against all the possible opponents of uh, the future of computers. He said they might say something like, a computer will never do X, with X being something, right? He's a mathematician, so he, he loves variable and X. And the X in question would be in his paper, for instance, making mistakes. And we all know that, of course, computers make mistakes. Another example was uh, being the subject of its own thought. And if you think of debuggers, debuggers actually a counterexample of this. Another example would be a diversity of behavior. And Turing really argues and explains how his, um, his vision is that with sufficient computational resources, the number of uh, the diversity of behavior would be huge. And another topic, actually, uh, beside the uh, enduring strawberry and cream, which is kind of hilarious for me, but another topic he didn't uh, really address, but he did mention, is having a sense of humor. So already Turing was really looking, have a, having a sense of humor being a really, really hard challenge. And for us, it's really a, a, a beautiful opportunity for what we call customer-obsessed science. So you heard Swami uh, introduce that uh, concept before. It's something pretty unique to Amazon. Uh, we do everything in a customer-obsessed way. Uh, we go backward from the customers uh, in our thinking and in our method. We don't start from technology. We really start from, from uh, the customer needs or pain points. And here again, right, if we want to tackle computational humor, we want to do it from a customer backward manner. What does that mean in the context of computational humor? Instead of having the robot, the machine, being the funny one, we want to look customer backward whether customers are funny and how should the machine react to it. In a um, dialogue management system, it's called mixed initiative. Who is taking the initiative? Is it the machine or the user? In our case here, we don't want to look at right away for, at the machine taking the initiative with the customer. So that's what we did. We went uh, basically to this challenge of detecting humor when customers are the one being funny. And we started with something, before going into the hard challenge of Alexa, we went first to something a little bit simpler. We went to our Amazon.com website, and we looked at our customer in um, their question and answer when they you know, refer to products. And you know what? We, we actually discovered tons of pretty funny questions. Let's start with this uh, first example, for instance. Um, Nintendo Switch, Ray, Joy-Con. And you see the type of uh, question that appear there. Basically, can you hack into this machine and into the matrix and save humanity? And here, for those who are familiar with sci-fi, it's, it's a reference to the matrix, a, a cult movie that I actually personally love. And you already see something that is part of humor. In order for this joke to work, you need to, have, to get the cultural reference. If you never heard about the metrics, you will not laugh, right? Said, what is he talking about? That's already one of, you know, piece of information we will use uh, in our research. Common cultural reference is key uh, to detecting humor. Another example is sarcasm, you know, and again, here you have a product which is uh, a little bit probably for the customer too expensive. So asking whether uh, uh, the, the luxury cooler will make them fly. Sarcasm, funny. Um, here, another, a third example with the Echo Show, and that's something that we start to see here. Does it cook breakfast? That's actually another type of humor that we are going to detect. Is when um, it's called, it belongs to what's called the superiority theory of humor, when you refer to a robot as if it was a human being. Again, it's pretty interesting. 
And then, you know, here is my favorite one, actually, is that when the product itself is funny, it's going to attract, actually, even more humor. Um, the, uh, the last one, you know, whether banana bends in the other direction, this one I really, really find funny, personally. That's my, my type of humor. Um, but that really, you know, this product made us think that some products are, are like standard products attract some humor. Some other products are themselves funny and they will attract way more humor. Take this other example. It's a joke, right? Unicorn meat, unfortunately, it's a joke. And this type of product, a playful product, att attracts basically tons of playful questions because people are already in the mood of being playful. That gave us some actually uh, insight when we wanted to build our model, our deep learning model to detect humor, that we had to be super careful with what is called domain bias and make sure that we will be able to differentiate between products that attract funny funny question, like is this very weird Swiss army knife giant, you know, does it come with a cell phone because it has everything? I'm explaining the joke that kills the humor usually. But in any case, we, we build this deep learning model and we made sure to verify some elements of humor that we detected, we, we learned from the humor theory, like incongruity, subjectivity. We did, you know, the regular embedding, we build our model, and the good news, when we do take into account this domain bias to make sure we don't overfit our models, we were pretty good at detecting whether a question is going to be funny or not. You see our results, you know, between 84 to 91% of accuracy, not bad. We were pretty happy about that, and we had a, a publication at SIGAIR, uh, the conference uh, last year, about, about exactly this topic. So we had a proof of concept that it's possible to detect humor, uh, at least in text. So now we turn to the second and you know, bigger challenge, uh, basically humorous utterances when customers are joking with Alexa. So that's where we started. Um, and we had here, we had here a conjecture. Because we know that in robots, when the robot is trying to be funny, you know, there, there have been previous research on the topic, people appreciate it, you know, it keeps engagement. But the key question here, if you are trying to be funny with Alexa and you're showing something, you're trying to be funny not with Alexa, but at Alexa, are you going to appreciate it if Alexa answers, gets your humor or not? Maybe you want this feeling of superiority and you don't want Alexa, you want actually to be the one, you know, making fun of Alexa. So. That can, in, in any good research, we, need, we have a conjecture and we need to demonstrate it. So we looked at this type of, uh, I'm going to go back later how we are going to demonstrate this, uh, this conjecture, but before that, let's, let's look at some example utterances, true utterances from our customer. First one, Alexa, can you buy me a Lamborghini? Uh, you definitely don't want Alexa uh, you know, to put a Lamborghini in your shopping list. Uh, Another example, so that we, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, depends on your type of humor, you will see a ton of toilet humor because people enjoy it and it's part actually of a very serious uh, theory of humor which is called relief theory. Um, another, actually you can try this one if you want, Alexa will answer. Um, an exa another example which is even, you know, um, for me more interesting because it's, it's a different, still something totally different, which is referring to Alexa as if it was, uh, Alexa was a human being. Alexa, what is your blood type? And you see here, actually, that it's not really funny, but it's this playful. Customers are not expecting Alexa to take this request seriously. Uh, if we go back to the theory of humor, it relates to what's called personification and superiority, because you're a human being, you're superior, and you're not really expecting Alexa to, to answer that question. So we had this definition because funny and, you know, and humor is difficult and very subjective. It's very hard to, to define it formally, but we could define, have a formal definition. We define playfulness. And by that, we, dis, we, we, uh, we mean that a customer is being playful where actually the customer doesn't expect Alexa to take this request literally. And that means that we shouldn't act on it, not add anything to your shopping list, for instance. So, we have this definition. We went back to theory, and here uh, I personally had a blast uh, looking very old, you know, at papers, very old papers, you know, dating back to Aristotle and, 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 and Plato, and you know, and Kant and Schopenhauer worked, you know, worked on theory of humor. And you have these three main theories of humor, 
relief, we mentioned it before, toilet humor. Uh, incongruity, which is my favorite, where it's really out of context and that's what makes you laugh. Um, you know, dog eating pizza is weird, that's incongruous. It might make you smile, maybe not laugh. Superiority theory, the example I gave before, you know, with uh, this uh, robot thing, actually that the same superiority theory that make people laugh when someone, uh, you know, sleep on a banana peel. I don't think it's that funny, but you know, it makes some people laugh. And so we have this theory, we looked at that, it helped us basically, you know, think uh, um, on how to organize our, our models. You know, if we go back to the conjecture we want to, to really verify, to validate, is whether people will enjoy it. And that really, remember, we are customer obsessed company, we do customer obsessed science. If they are not going to enjoy Alexa understanding their humor, we should not investigate it, not important. So we started with that conjecture with personification. And you remember personification in when you refer to Alexa as a human being or, or as a robot. And the reason for which we did that is that in Alexa, that's really the majority of the traffic, which makes sense because people are so excited to have a, a robot to play with. So we started with that and we wanted to uh, verify our conjecture. So here is the idea we had to, uh, to verify this conjecture. We started with a kind of semi-assisted uh, Wizard of Oz experiment. If you're, you're, you know, you're familiar with Wizard of Oz settings, someone behind the scene is just uh, you know, pretending to, to do the, the real job, to be the wizard. So we recruited 100 student uh, questions, a little bit more, and we asked them to ask personification question to an agent. They didn't know it was Alexa behind the scene. Actually, they thought that it would be uh, an agent, a new research agent called Shirley. Again, maybe poor humor. It's a cultural reference to airplane if you're familiar with the movie. Uh, surely you must be serious or something like that. But you can go back to it. And then we asked them to do that, but to, to ask this question and then we would react. But because they would ask too many questions, it wouldn't be like, you know, feasible for all people behind the scene to be funny all the time and answer all the time. So we decided to do it semi-assisted and build a model that would verify that these questions are really a personification questions. So that's what we did. We built a you know, deep learning model, pre-trained BERT, you're all familiar with BERT. On top of it, we built, we fine-tuned BERT and we had this fully connected layer where we injected more of these families of features coming from, hum from humor theory, simplicity so that people understand your joke, um, emotion because humor is subjective, uh, you know, you, so you need sentiment analysis, polarity, etc. We built this model and we had a pretty good uh, model actually. We, we got something, uh, you know, around, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to have something, you know, with high precision and recall to detect these uh, funny personification utterances on the fly. We needed to train this model, right? Otherwise, we would not uh, reach this precision and recall uh, uh, thresholds. So the team had this really cool idea where they went to a speed dating site. They thought, where, when are you really uh, the most personal? Uh, when do you ask really personal questions? In speed dating, these are the type of questions you ask. And for, that's for positive examples. And for the negative example, we, uh, we just took that from Alexa traffic. So we went with that. And here are the questions that were asked. When there were personification as validated by our model, it went um, to Alexa, to us, right? And um, if Alexa can answer, for instance, what do you do for fun? Alexa answers, and when Alexa cannot answer, our team generated this type of uh, questions. They have some humor, some are funny, some less so. And the good, good news, we did a qualitative survey afterwards, and the good news that really all the users enjoyed it. They didn't feel that, um, you know, Alexa was presbyterous to try to understand their joke. They really enjoyed it. So that really convinced us we want to have fun not at Alexa, but with Alexa. And to, to conclude, right, uh, I, I really want to thank you know, my, the, the brilliant uh, team of scientists that are behind this research. Um, big thanks to us, to them. I think it's a new era that we are starting here in computational humor. Thank you all. I look forward to having more humorous conversations with Alexa in the future. One of the great things about working at Amazon is the fact that we can deploy new machine learning services at scale, learn, and then improve upon them through customer feedback. In fact, many of the services we at AWS offer to customers come straight from our experience at Amazon, 
where we have been investing in machine learning for 20 plus years and delivering it to millions of consumers. For example, Amazon Lex, our chatbot technology at AWS, is powered by the same deep learning technology that goes into Alexa. Amazon Personalize, a service for real-time personalized recommendations, is based off of the Amazon recommendation system, which was launched in the early days of Amazon and refined over decades. Another example where we were able to iterate and improve on a product by implementing it at scale within Amazon is Amazon Monitron, a new end-to-end -end system that uses machine learning to detect abnormal behavior in industrial machinery. Each of Amazon.com's fulfillment centers have miles of conveyor belts weaving throughout the facility, and they deploy sophisticated equipment to assist employees to pick, pack, and ship thousands of customer orders every day. If equipment fails or requires unplanned maintenance, it can have a huge impact on our operations. So it is the perfect environment for us to pressure test Amazon Monitron. We used a fulfillment center in Germany as a testbed, installing 800 sensors on equipment in order to catch instances of abnormal vibrations on multiple conveyors and alert technicians of potential issues. Through this process, we learned a lot and iterated together on a variety of capabilities, including how to reduce false alerts, improving the sensor commissioning user experience, and develop a better understanding of the optimal range of a sensor to a gateway. In the next 12 months, Amazon will be installing tens of thousands of Monitron sensors and thousands of Monitron gateways across dozens of Amazon fulfillment centers worldwide. This helps enable our FCs to reduce unplanned equipment downtime and improve the customer experience. So, I have given you a few examples of how customer obsessed science makes it into the products and services we deliver to our customers. We take this approach to customer obsessed science across our entire ML stack, whether we are inventing for data scientists, developers, and increasingly even business users. For developers and increasingly business users, we are building AI services to address common horizontal and industry-specific use cases to easily add intelligence to any applications without needing machine learning skills. I've spoken about several of these already, Amazon TextRank, Amazon Recognition, Amazon Lookout for Vision, and Amazon Monitron. We embed AutoML in these AI services so that customers don't need to worry about data preparation, feature engineering, algorithm selection, training, and tuning, inference, and model monitoring. And instead, they can remain focused on their business outcomes. These services help customers do things like personalize the customer experience, identify and triage anomalies in business metrics, image recognition, automatically extract meaning from documents, and more. We have also built a suite of solutions for the industrial sector that use visual data to improve process and services that use data from machines for predictive maintenance. In healthcare, we have purpose-built solutions for transcription, medical text comprehension, and Amazon Health Lake, a new HIPAA-eligible service to store, transform, query, and analyze petabytes of health data in the cloud. For those data scientists and ML developers who are building their own ML models, we are also invested in making machine learning faster and easier to do with Amazon SageMaker. We built Amazon SageMaker from the ground down to provide every developer and data scientist with the ability to build, train, and deploy ML models quickly and at a lower cost by providing the tools required for every step of the ML development lifecycle in one integrated, fully managed service. For expert machine learning practitioners, researchers, and data scientists, we focus on giving a choice and flexibility with optimized versions of the most popular deep learning frameworks, including PyTorch, MXNet, and TensorFlow, which set records throughout the year for the fastest training times and lowest inference latency. And AWS provides the broadest and deepest portfolio of compute, networking, and storage infrastructure services 
with a choice of processes and accelerators to meet our customers' unique performance and budget needs for machine learning. Now, going back to our third pillar of customer obsessed science, we must be able to learn and iterate at scale in order to deliver good science to our customers. And at AWS, we are focused on helping our customers do this with machine learning. But it can be a challenge to deploy machine learning at scale. To talk more about the work we are doing there to help our customers learn and iterate at scale with machine learning, I'd like to introduce Bratan Saha, VP of Machine Learning Services at AWS. Thank you, Swami. When we launched our machine learning services a little over three years ago, most customers would deploy a few models, maybe a dozen models for different use cases. Today, our customers deploy thousands and even millions of models across the lines of business. Machine learning is becoming an integral part of how AWS customers do business, and many of these customers have standardized on Amazon SageMaker. In fact, today, SageMaker supports hundreds of billions of predictions per month, and customers have reported training models with billions of parameters, which is orders of magnitude more than just two years back. From a dozen models to millions of models and billions of parameters and hundreds of billions of predictions in just a couple of years. So what I want to talk about is how we convert the customer-obsessed science into customer-obsessed products and enable customers to use the science at scale and in the real world. It's tens of thousands of customers from virtually every industry, including financial services, healthcare, media, sports, retail, automotive, and manufacturing. These customers are seeing significant results from standardizing their ML workloads on SageMaker. Let's take a look at some of them. Lyft's Autonomous Vehicle Division Level 5 reduced model training time from days to just hours. T-Mobile saved data scientists significant time in labeling thousands upon thousands of messages by using SageMaker Ground Truth. iFood, the leader in online food delivery in Latin America, uses Amazon SageMaker to optimize delivery routes to decrease the distance traveled by delivery partners by almost 12%. And finally, ADP reduced time to deploy machine learning models from two weeks to just one day. And it's not just our customers who are making groundbreaking transformations with SageMaker. Many of us are also using SageMaker in our daily lives. For example, when you order on Amazon.com, you are using SageMaker. In order to achieve its current scale, Amazon had to overcome several challenges along the way, including provisioning and managing expensive infrastructure like GPUs and integrating and managing a variety of tools. Amazon fulfillment technologies must monitor millions of global shipments annually to deliver on Amazon's promise that items will be readily available and they will arrive on time. Therefore, an internal team built a proprietary computer vision-based software solution that scanned millions of images across fulfillment centers to identify misplaced inventory worldwide. However, the solution did not support piloting new models. That is, it did not enable new models to handle requests alongside the old models. And so the team could not test new models using live production data without risking service disruptions. As a result, teams had to develop ML models offline and then validate and test them manually offline and then bring them online, which often took three to six months. To address these challenges, the team turned to Amazon SageMaker and they were able to reduce the deployment time to just two weeks from the three to six months before. Moreover, they reduced the prediction latency by 50% by using GPUs and SageMaker also relieved the development team of having to manage their ML infrastructure. In fact, the team got an extra month of engineering time that they could devote to building models rather than on maintaining their infrastructure and operational tasks. In other words, a full month of engineering time that they could focus on the differentiated work 
rather than on the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing their infrastructure. The results from Amazon fulfillment centers are a perfect example of why we build SageMaker. We are building SageMaker along three vectors, infrastructure that is purpose-built for machine learning, tools that are customized for machine learning, and ML industrialization. Now, I would like to dive deep into each of these three vectors, starting with purpose-built infrastructure. SageMaker provides the broadest set of instances for your machine learning needs. And for inference, we launched Inferentia-based instances. Inferentia provides the lowest cost of inference in the cloud, up to 70% lower cost and 130% higher throughput than current GPU-based instances. After migrating the vast majority of inferences to Inferentia, the Amazon Alexa team saw 25% lower end-to-end -end latency for the text-to-speech workloads. And customers such as Snap, Autodesk, and Condé Nast also found that Inferentia gives them higher performance and lower cost. Condé Nast, for instance, observed a 72% reduction in cost than the previously deployed GPU instances. Truly game-changing results in Inferentia for our customers. For training, we have two major efforts. The first is Habana Gaudi accelerators from Intel, which will offer 40% better price performance over current GPU-based EC2 instances for training deep learning models. They will be available to customers in 2021. The second is AWS Trainium, a machine learning chip custom designed by AWS for the most cost-effective training in the cloud and is coming later this year. We are building Trainium specifically to provide the best price performance for training machine learning models in the cloud. Now, our infrastructure innovations must also span to software because it helps our customers better utilize their hardware. Many of the most common use cases for machine learning, such as personalization, require you to manage anywhere from a few hundred to hundreds of thousands of models. For example, taxi services train custom models based on each city's traffic patterns to predict rider wait times. While this approach leads to higher prediction accuracy, the downside is that the cost to deploy the models increases significantly. In a traditional ML system, a customer would have to deploy one model per instance, which means the customer would have to deploy hundreds or thousands of instances, and the cost would go up significantly. Therefore, we invented Amazon SageMaker multi-model endpoints that allow a customer to host up to 1,000 models from a single instance, reducing the cost by orders of magnitude, with SageMaker doing all the traffic management and model management on behalf of the customer. For example, SageMaker uses sophisticated caching algorithms to understand which models should be resident in memory at a particular instant so your prediction latency and throughput can be optimized. Next, let's look at how we build tools that are tailored for machine learning. Because ML models and predictions are only as good as the data that they act upon, it's important for customers to analyze their data at each step of the machine learning workflow. Therefore, we build SageMaker Clarify that allows you to do statistical analysis of your data and your models across each step of the machine learning workflow. We also build Clarify so that you can understand why are your models making certain predictions. Many customers such as Varo, Bundesliga, and Zopa are using SageMaker Clarify to increase confidence in their ML models and provide greater transparency to stakeholders. I would like to dive deeper into the science behind SageMaker Clarify. It's based on Lloyd Shapley's work, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for economics, but we had to customize it for machine learning. In economic game theory, you use Shapley values to understand which actions have the most impact on winning a game. Similarly, SageMaker Clarify runs a number of experiments on your model and utilizes Shapley values to understand which inputs contribute the most to a model's predictions. 
This allows Clarify to provide more actionable insights and allows you to take more informed business decisions. For example, if Clarify says your model is predicting higher customer churn because of hold times, then you can work on improving the SLA in your call center. But we didn't stop there. We also improved the SHAP algorithm so it runs 10 times faster compared to open source implementations. With the innovation in infrastructure and tooling we have discussed so far, you might start to see a theme emerging. And that is, how do we convert machine learning into a systematic engineering discipline which will help customers cross the chasm between research results and production deployments, leading to a third vector, ML industrialization. For this, we asked ourselves, how did software go from a niche endeavor to an industry? Now, ML deals not just with code, but with data as well. But we realized that much of the same tooling concepts carry over to the ML world as well. And just as IDEs and debuggers and profilers and CI-CD tools made software development robust, we are building custom tools for machine learning, such as SageMaker Studio, which is the world's first IDE for machine learning, SageMaker debuggers, SageMaker profilers, and SageMaker pipelines to make machine learning robust. Let me dive deeper into one of them. In software engineering, Continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines are critical to ensuring automation and robustness. But in machine learning, CI-CD style tools are rarely available, and where they do exist, they are super hard to set up, configure, and manage. And in the spirit of making analogous tools available to ML developers, we built Amazon SageMaker pipelines. SageMaker pipelines are the first purpose-built ML CI-CD service accessible to every developer and data scientist. SageMaker Pipelines has been tremendously helpful to support governance and audit requirements because Pipelines automatically tracks code, data sets, and artifacts at every step of the ML workflow. So just like with software, you can roll back, replay steps, and troubleshoot your problems, and reliably track the lineage of models at scale across thousands of models in production. Many customers such as iFood, Care.com, Invista, and 3M have been able to scale using SageMaker pipelines because with just a few clicks in SageMaker pipelines, you can create an entirely automated ML workflow that reduces months of coding to just a few hours. I've discussed how SageMaker innovation in infrastructure, tools, and ML industrialization has made machine learning scale. Another critical factor to success with ML is making sure we grow the talent pool and help more people become ML practitioners. At Amazon, our goal is to train every developer we hire on machine learning. In fact, machine learning courses are now mandatory for any engineer joining Amazon, and we want to make training accessible to even more developers. Therefore, I'm very excited to announce a new MOOC focused on practical applications of data science. The MOOC is now available on Coursera, and we built it in partnership with DeepLearning.ai, which is an educational technology company founded by Dr. Andrew Eng. Starting now, you can take the new course, and it's ideal for those who are now ready to practically implement models in their organizations. Because this marks the first time we have collaborated with DeepLearning.ai, we decided to host a fireside chat later today where you can hear from both Swami and Andrew. They will talk about the future of ML, how to accelerate model building and deployment, and how to build a business case for your project. I think it will be a fascinating discussion by two luminaries in ML today. See you there. And with that, I'll pass it back to Swami. Thank you, Bratan. At AWS, we invent on behalf of the customers so they can create better experiences for their customers. One customer we have been working with since the very early days of machine learning at AWS is Intuit. And they have been rapidly increasing their adoption of machine learning throughout their business. To talk more about what they are doing with AWS, 
to accelerate their deployment of machine learning at scale to meet their customer needs, I'd like to introduce Ashok Srivastav, Chief Data Officer and Senior Vice President at Intuit. Thanks, Swami. It's great to be here. I'm really excited to be able to tell you about the great work in AI and machine learning that we're pursuing at Intuit to help drive great customer benefits. At Intuit, we build products such as TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint to help people make better financial decisions and to help them save more money, reduce their workload, and all the while have confidence that they're making great financial decisions. Our mission is to power prosperity around the world. And if you think about it, now more than ever, people need to make the best financial decisions for themselves and for their families. Small businesses, consumers, the self-employed are all being pushed to the limit because of COVID and other issues. So check out some of these statistics. Every time I look at them, I'm amazed and inspired by the value that we bring to our customers. For example, our Intuit Aid Assist program helped small businesses secure more than $1.2 billion through the Paycheck Protection Program. TurboTax powered over 48 million tax returns last year. We connected our customers to over 20,000 financial institutions. QuickBooks Capital delivered over $750 million in cumulative loans. And we have over 25 million active Mint users. Those people use those products to understand their finances. Now, what makes this fantastic is that many of the game-changing customer experiences I mentioned are powered by AI and machine learning at scale. Back in 2013, we began our journey with AWS into the cloud. That transition helped us start this epic journey to drive innovation in AI and machine learning. Add into it, we've been able to put over 250 AI assets into production. We have over 2,000 AI tasks in production, which essentially counts the number of customer tasks that are powered by AI. One AI system can power multiple customer experiences. And as a testament to our innovation, we filed over 600 AI and machine learning patents in the last few years. So now the question is, how did we accelerate this process? You know, we looked at all of the work that it takes for our AI scientists and engineers to put a model into production. And we thought about the AI hierarchy of needs, as you can see in this pyramid. Now, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have data infrastructure and we have machine learning infrastructure. And at the top, we have the actual AI model development and deployment. We want our AI scientists and engineers to focus on the top part, and we want to use great infrastructure capabilities to eliminate unnecessary workload at the bottom. And that's where 70% of a person's time can be spent if you're not careful. This is where our great collaboration with AWS became critical to our AI journey. As we modernized our infrastructure, we moved into the cloud to help us have the scale, the speed, and the elasticity that we need. We treated data as a product to enable our AI scientists and engineers to get the data that they need quickly and efficiently. And you know, we built critical data infrastructure to help our team really get access to clean data as rapidly as possible with great tools for implementing data pipelines. So check out what happens when you make the investment to modernize with AWS. We have a 30% decrease in downtime. We've tripled the speed of delivery and we've seen a 60% increase in mobile app deployments. And when you make those investments in core infrastructure, the benefits to your AI teams are immense. Remember the top of that pyramid? Take a look at where we are now. We have increased the number of deployed models by 50%. We've saved over 25,000 hours for our customers. And we've reduced expert review time by 50%. We've had a fantastic collaboration with AWS, and it's been foundational to our strategy to become an AI-driven expert platform. This platform helps us deliver 
more money, no work, and complete confidence to small businesses, to the self-employed, and the consumers around the world. We've connected people to our experts by building a virtual expert platform. Let me tell you a little bit about how this works. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you how we constructed the virtual expert platform. And we connected it with our machine learning platform to deliver great experiences for our customers. The foundational layer has many AWS components, including Amazon SageMaker, Connect, Lex, Poly, and EKS. Now, on top of that foundational AWS layer, we built the machine learning platform, which has many features necessary to build and deploy models. These include data exploration capabilities, feature extraction and feature management, model training and evaluation, making predictions, and model execution. We have a significant MLOps capability to really ensure operational excellence. Now, to finally build that virtual expert platform, we needed to create additional capabilities. Many of them are powered by AI, such as expert routing and matchmaking, collaboration, and expert management to ultimately help get a fast answer to a question from a real customer. So for example, suppose a customer calls up and has a question about whether they can deduct a home renovation. We can assess in real time the needs of the customer and the context and route them to the right expert. This is done with capabilities such as interactive voice assistant, digital assistant, and natural language processing. The virtual expert platform helps connect customers with experts so that they can get the best personalized advice in the business. Let me take you a little bit closer and show you what TurboTax Live does. So TurboTax Live is powered by the virtual expert platform, just as we discussed. We ask you a few simple questions about your work, your family, and other relevant information about your taxes. We're connected with over 20,000 financial institutions, so importing your bank information and W-2 information is really easy. And if you have a question, you can get answers from our AI-powered digital assistant. But if you want to talk to a human expert and get even more personalized advice, you can call and through the magic of the virtual expert platform, you can get connected to the right expert and get your questions answered. Great technologies such as our routing and matchmaking algorithms help make this possible. We've had a fantastic collaboration with AWS and look forward to so many more. We're always focusing on our customers, learning about their needs, and building solutions that help them make great financial decisions. We're building the next generation of our machine learning platform to give developers the deep connections that they need to specific modules in the platform. We're really excited about continuing to augment human intelligence with machine intelligence so that our customers and experts can have the best experiences and most importantly, have the very best outcomes. I'd like to thank the entire team at AWS for such a great collaboration. Thank you so much, Swami. Thank you, Ashok. It's clear to see throughout this presentation that machine learning is really transforming everything from the way we do business to the way we entertain ourselves to the way we get things done in our personal lives. In fact, entire business processes are being made easier with machine learning. Marketers can more easily tailor their message. Supply chain analysts can have faster and more accurate forecasts. And manufacturers can easily spot defects in products. Over the past few years, machine learning has come an incredibly long way. The barriers to entry have been significantly lowered, enabling builders to quickly apply machine learning to their most pressing challenges and their biggest opportunities. And I'm excited to see what you all will build next. And with that, I'll end by saying that I hope that you are as excited as I am about the work happening in machine learning across AWS, Amazon, and the broader industry. We have a powerhouse lineup of speakers today with something for everyone interested in machine learning. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.